Oh, you're trying. Dad, is your cell phone turned off? It's in the car. Okay. Okay, today is October 13th, 2007. We're at the Circle Cinema in Tulsa, and today we're pleased to have Mr. Bill Caldwell of Sand Springs, who is a first lieutenant in the Air Force, attached to the 8th Air Force Division. Right. Mr. Caldwell, thank you for joining us today, and if you would just tell us your story. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for having me, and I hope I can get through this in time. Uh, <clears throat> My story is uh, also about my four brothers, and it was very important, and I'm very proud to be part of the five boys that went into the service and all went overseas and all came home. So that was uh, more of think about it and talk to other people. It was quite an honor. And my mother and dad thought it was the greatest thing that they'd ever, they just so proud of us, they couldn't see. And she was awarded a, a five star, what used to be blue star, gold star mother. Of these five boys, uh, I think one of them had a really a rough go. And it was brother George, <clears throat> who was in the uh, field artillery. He was a forward observer, a lieutenant, landed at uh, uh, Normandy, and he was shot out of a tree. He was up on the bluff, if you saw the movie The Wars, and he was up in a tree on top of that bluff, and <clears throat> the bullet went through his heel and also broke the branch, and he fell there. Well, he went back to England, and rehabilitated the the heel, came back, and he got another purple heart. A bullet went through his cheek and out back here and didn't break a tooth. So that healed up and he came back. And he had, in the Battle of the Bulge, um, he was pulling his sergeant who was very badly wounded. And shrapnel got him in the right back shoulder blade and he had to come home. But I had one in the uh, 45th Division, a brother, that came up through uh, Africa, Italy and Sicily and Italy and Anzio and so on. Another brother that was in the Pacific, he was a crew chief on the B-25 and was real proud of his outfit and the job he was doing. My oldest brother was too old to come in to be drafted or get in the service, so he wanted to be in with the rest of us, so he joined the Seabees and was sent to the South Pacific. And nobody had any more fun than he did, especially out of my mother. <clears throat> so that's enough for those uh, those guys, three of us still living. Now, in addition to that, I had a first cousin that came to live with us. His name was Bill Caldwell also. And we were in the 45th Division. And in 1940, March of 1940, if you weren't 18 years old, you had to get out. Or you could get out. Well, Cousin Bill was 18. My birthday was in May and I couldn't get out. I mean, I could get out and I did. But I had, uh, I went in the guards at age 14 in 1936 and I had three and a half years in and I wasn't 18 yet. So, <clears throat> but Bill stayed in and he went to Germany and uh, with the 45th Division and came back and uh, made a career of, of the Army. <clears throat> My uh, Air Force career started in really in 1942 when I signed up for the Air Force, took all the tests, and was called to active duty in 1943. And <clears throat> went through pilot training and 
um, a cadet pilot training and was assigned to a B-17 originally as a co-pilot. And we went to Germany, went to England and flew out of there and on my 22nd mission, I have been assigned my own crew and I was shot down over near the Russian line, which was not far from Dresden. <clears throat> and we lost several members of our crew, but we got together the next day and stayed together. I became good friends with our radio operator, Ed Howard, from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and the uh, bombardier off of another plane that was shot down, his name George Peden, and he happened to be from Hilton, Oklahoma. So we stayed together all during the, our POW days and really got to know one another. I think one of the dumbest, craziest, funniest things we did was about three days after we were captured, we had moved us uh, to a maintenance base and it was run aircraft maintenance and it was all the people we saw later was just a bunch of women with big coveralls on big girls and that we they put us in there this jail at night and at 12 o'clock the British bomb and the siren went off at 12 <clears throat> and these ladies or women they started hitting the ditch, you know, getting off the road. Well, the guards, they turned off the lights and took off and left us locked in that little old freestanding building. It made us mad. And so the next day we practiced. We had a little window. It was about eight cells, two to a cell. So we started practicing making the sound of a siren. And so seven or eight windows with that two to a window, we had a pretty good voice. So the next day at noon at about five minutes to 12, we got to the window and gave our little sound. Well, there's these people walking down the street and they started hitting the ditch. Water splashing everywhere. Oh, we thought that and the old guards, they took off. So we did that from, for three days that we were there. And they never, nobody said anything. They didn't know what it wasn't their regular siren, I guess. But we did a lot of things that were not really smart, but we had a lot of, had a, a lot of fun. In spite of being a POW? Yes. Wow. And you can talk to I haven't talked to George Peden lately, but I talked to Ed Howard about a week ago. And he said, tell everything you can. I told him I was going to be on this show. He said, I can't remember anything. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I'll have to tell you one thing that he was, the first day out, it was real cloudy. We marched from Nuremberg down to Munich when we were our final destination. Our first day out, it was real cloudy and a P-47 bombed us. We were in a little town, a little marshalling yards and killed one of our boys. But when he came down through the clouds, we hit the ditch. And one of these German guards jumped in on Ed, hit him in the back. And he'd already been shot with shrapnel and was having a hard time with that. But we had to lift him up. I thought we was going to have to carry him the rest of that walk down to uh, Moosburg, Germany, which was over about 100 miles. But he got okay. But that was one of his memorable moments. So... <clears throat> we had several incidents on the way down that uh, it was the farm people were 
the ladies, the women at home were always glad to give us something, a, a cartoffel, potato, or a, <clears throat> a cipher, which is an onion, and they want us to sign a little slip that they had done something nice for us. But they were, it was a, we were just on our own from Nuremberg to Munich. If we wanted to try to escape, they, they said, do it. We had no guards, nobody telling you what to do. It was just a free march. What, what was the signing of that slip that those civilians? That they had done something nice for us. <clears throat> and then when we took over, which we were, they knew it was war was about over, that Fra uh, Franklin had done something nice for some Americans. So they wouldn't be punished or penalized yeah, or something? Yeah, they would be given some leniency. Okay. About <clears throat> 10 o'clock on the morning of April the 29th when we were being, we, we knew our guys were near, the Patton's group. We could hear bullets going and they said, everybody get flat on the ground and stay there. Well, <clears throat> about 11 o'clock, <clears throat> these old guards, German guards, were the military, uh, the, were citizens, civilians that were too old to go into active service. So they call them the Wehrmacht. And we had a chicken wire fence about 15 feet high. Flimsy old fence. And these old guard, <clears throat> these guards started throwing their guns over into the compound and climbing up over this fence to get in there with us for protection. They was afraid that these American soldiers come in because we could hear the, the bullets were, were coming through the barracks now. We could hear him whistling through the trees, and so that was kind of funny. The old fellows had hit the ground, and every one of them would be stunned. Uh, they hit like a sack of oats, you know, and but the, they'd run and get in the barracks because they were didn't want to try to outshoot our soldiers coming. At about noon, we heard tanks and trucks. So they opened the gate to the prison and in rolls General Patton. He was sitting up on the, his jeep like a beauty queen, sit, make it in a parade, and comes rolling in the, the little prison. <clears throat> and my memory is that he didn't salute or wave to us. My friend Ed said he thought he did. But he didn't make many gestures. But he had his pearl handled pistols and <clears throat> his battle jacket. Boy, it was tucked in and he looked like a professional wrestler. Well, he went in the building and stayed a little while and came back and got in that Jeep. And if he saluted, it was very slow. But we were close enough to see his face easily. I wasn't on the front row, but we were close. And he left, and the gates were open to the to the uh, uh, Stalag Seven, and we could do whatever we wanted to. It was, as far as we were concerned, we were liberated. Were you were you malnourished or the prisoners? Were they oh yeah, that was the, the main. Mistreatment we had is um, we always lost a lot of weight. Nothing like the boys in the Pacific or some of our prisoners up in northern Germany. But I'd lost around <clears throat> 30 pounds, but they had the food there, but they wouldn't give it to us, which what they call uh, uh, Red Cross parcels, which is a tell. 12 pound box of food that's supposed to last you for a week. We went out of one of those prisons and a warehouse was full of those boxes and they never gave us a one. So it was that was the main mistreatment. 
So if you have any questions. How many points did you accumulate for you to come home? Did you accumulate points to get you to come back to the States after the war? No? Is that not? No, if you were a prisoner of war, they got us out of there just as quick as they could. Oh, I see. Okay. I was shot down on my 22nd mission, but I was supposed to have 30 on that score. It used to be 25, and then they moved it to 30. But just being a prisoner of war, they moved us over to some temporary camps, and they flew us home from there. Write it out. Okay, how about being shot down? They lined you up against the wall. Well, the day we were shot down, it was pretty trying because we had two direct hits into our engines, and they were on fire, and we tried, used our routine to put them out and couldn't. And when we landed, I mean, when we bailed out, there was an old German farmer was there, come running at me with a pitchfork. So they took us to a little town, four or five hundred people, and marched us down into a, just looked like a warehouse, and we stood up next to this building, and it was damp, and put our face to the building. So the thought ran through every one of our minds that they were going to have target practice with us. And it was damp there, and it looked like we all thought, just about all of us, that they had already shot one group, and they'd plastered it back, and it was they hadn't let the mortar dry yet. And here they were going to get us too. But and they cocked their guns, their rifles, and it seemed like an hour, but they took the rifles down and let us turn around, and they told us, you know, what we uh, what we'd done, and they stood there, and <clears throat> but it was kind of nerve wracking for a, a few minutes by having our back to those guys with their guns, and it seen so many pictures of the Alamo and <laughs> where they they where they uh, executed people. What? <clears throat> well, when I was in England, a uh, little air base named Deethan Green, which was a little town named Attleboro, uh, I'd been corresponding with my brother-in-law, J.T. Neal, and he was stationed at Thetford. So we <clears throat> set up a time and how to get there and everything, which it wasn't very far. So I went there two or three times to to see him, and he was in the Air Force, but in the supply division. So we uh, we had always had a good time visiting there. And, but other than that, <clears throat> I did see one of my friends that uh, I'd gone to college with, but we uh, we met twice. He was in the army, so that was uh, about the extent of meeting uh, any of the friends and relatives that we had. Now I had I didn't know it, but uh, my brother was coming back. The one that got shot. He was coming back to England for rehabilitation about the time I was over there, before he went back to Europe. It turned out to be a small world, and it, he was there, and we both were there and didn't see each other. And where was the day? Where was the day? Uh, well, 
Oh, yeah. The one just over me, Floyd, was the one was the, I told about that in being a medic and coming up the 45th Division through uh, Italy and Sicily and on up to the, up in there. But he <clears throat> he had it pretty rough too. But another thing that uh, incident that happened that when, after I bailed out when I was shot down, we had gone without oxygen for so long that uh, I was out of. I just lucky I got this little air, uh, parachute on. <clears throat> and I heard this explosion, and I knew that. Looked up and saw that our airplane had blown up. So I pulled the cord, and that was quite a jolt when that air, when it opened and I'm coming down. It was <clears throat> it was quite a little pain there, but I'm flying through the air. We're looking to countryside, and here comes this German uh, fighter plane <clears throat> circling, <clears throat> and the thought ran through my mind that he was getting ready to do a little dark target practice on me there. But about that time, a P-51 came around and sent him flying, and he came back by and got so close that I could wave to him and, and then he flew off so I felt like I owed him a good round of thanks thank you very much is that it? that's it well I didn't see my sign it says five minutes or oh what you can you add on yeah, you want to do, you want to do, you have some more? No, 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 uh -uh. no, I didn't. I just was wondering, uh, you know, when, when was going to be able to, no, I think I, I covered. Okay, okay. I didn't cover it all, but uh, I said most of the things. Good, good. All right, well, we'll get this. Uh... I guess I got nervous. Did you? Yeah, I, I tensed step. Got, I got a horse. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We'll get the copy of the disc all. to you. Uh, is it next week, Ray? We get the disc? Uh, I'll see the next week. Next week at all. Next week at all. Oh, for the copies? Yeah. Yeah, I think next week. Okay. okay. I'm going to address everything, so we'll get it out to you. Thank you. So much. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'd mentioned earlier about being in the National Guards when I was 14 years old and was in there three and a half years before I was 18, which was the real age you're supposed to be in. But I was in the National Guard for that. I went to OU and I was in the Air Force Reserve for a year. Uh, Army Reserve and well, it was uh, Army Reserve, and then I go into the Air Force for three years. Then I stay in the reserve in the Air Force till 19 around 1950, and I was called back in the Korean War and got out of that in 1952. So. <clears throat> It's hard, people, first of all, how did you get in the National Guards at 14? Well, I had two brothers in the National Guards, so they had to jack their ages up. So one of them wound up being about 23 years old to make me 18 old enough to get in. But that was a quite a few experience. It, it kind of taught me that I didn't want to be in the Army. But I thought you might want to know that was a crazy 
different uh, span of service that I served there that none of it made sense. It's awful young to be getting in there, 14. It was, but you got a dollar a day for what they call drill, you know, once a week. Then the summer encampment of 14 days when you made a dollar. Of course, the eggs were 10 cents a dozen, gas 16 cents. <laughs>